In the previous lecture, we completed our understand our discussion of the different cache organizations and we started looking at some small programming examples to get a better appreciation of how small changes in a program or in a loop, an important loop of a program might affect the cache behavior, the cache performance that the program would, find, would, would benefit from when executed on a computer with cache memories. <coughs> and we were in the process of looking at a, a second example which I called vector dot product. Now all of the examples that we are looking at are relatively small in terms of the number of lines of C code, but they may be important in that they could be fairly frequently occurring operations in larger programs and therefore a proper understanding of such small but possibly important uh, loops is beneficial to us. So the second example which we are were looking at is what I call vector dot product and in the slide we had looked at the C uh, version of the vector dot product. <coughs> so as the name suggested it is uh, operation on vectors which are one dimensional arrays of data. In this particular case there are two vectors which are multiplied term for term and the sum of the products is the result of the dot product. So we see the for loop in C where the dot product of the vector A and the vector B is computed by element by element multiplying A of i by B of i and accumulating the sum in a double precision variable. Note once again that the both the vectors A and B are of size 2048 but more important they are each element of the vector is of type double precision or double float which means that the size of each element is 8 bytes. Okay, now the way that we were trying to understand this, uh, this kind of an example <coughs> was first of all by ignoring all the instructions though we know that instructions have to be fetched from memory we assume that the instructions will be benefit from a separate instruction cache and that we can concentrate our analysis on the data behavior. Further we will ignore certain pieces of data such as the loop index or a, a variable like sum <coughs> which could quite easily be uh, stored in registers by the compiler and we are therefore left only with the references to the array elements A and B which since there are 2048 of each it is unreasonable to assume that all of them can be accessed out of registers. So now <coughs> the next step was to understand specifically what this program, what this loop would amount to in terms of load and store instructions. In other words from the perspective of the cache or the memory system what does this program mean and we analyze it in terms of what I have referred to as a reference sequence, the sequence of memory references that result when this loop executes and looking at it from the, from the, at the level of the arrays A and B we realize that <coughs> in the first iteration through the for loop first of all A of 0 <coughs> will have to be loaded from memory into a register then B of 0 would have to be loaded from memory into a register and so they would be multiplied but we are not concerned about the multiply or the add or the other instructions we are concentrating only on loads and stores therefore the reference sequence would simply have load A of 0, load B of 0 in the first iteration. In the second iteration of the for loop load A of 1, load B of 1 and so on. So all of the 2048 iterations would look uh, along the lines of what we see here. Each iteration involving a load of an element of A and a load of the corresponding element of the vector B. So to proceed with our analysis we had to make some assumptions about what the addresses of the elements of A and B are and the base assumption that we made is the compiler will assign an address to the first element of A and to the first element of B and the subsequent elements of A and B would be in contiguous locations for example A of 1 would be in the location next to A of 0. So since each element of A is of size 8 bytes if A of 0 is at the address hex A000 then A of 1 would be at the address hex A008 which is 8 bytes after or it is a contiguous in memory to the location of A of 0 and similarly for all the other elements we similarly assume that the, that the compiler assigns B, the, the vector B to some other address range and this information will be important to us in doing the cache analysis since you will remember that to understand what is happening in the cache we have to keep track of the number of hits and misses when this uh, program executes or when this sequence of memory references is sent to the cache, the memory system. And therefore we had to do the analysis based on how the cache hardware views an address. And for the cache that we are considering 
you know, in the examples that we did last time, we were assuming that there is a data cache of size 16 kilobytes. The cache is direct mapped. It uses write back, uh, the write back update uh, memory update policy, and the size of each cache block is 32 bytes. From this, we could figure out exactly how the cache hardware views an address. So, if I look at the 32 bits of an address, such as the address, the base address of A or the base address of vector B, the least significant 5 bits are used as the offset to identify a particular byte within a block. The next significant 9 bits are used to index into the cache directory. Remember that we are assuming a direct mapped cache. And the remaining bits are used by the cache hardware to distinguish between hits and misses in terms of which main memory block is currently present in a given cache block. Therefore, this perspective for the particular cache that we are talking about, the 16 kilobyte cache with blocks of size 32 bytes and using direct map placement, is important for us to understand the behavior of the specific program that we are talking about. So we went about doing the analysis by actually deriving a table in which we had the different references. The references are load A of 0, load B of 0, load A of 1, load B of 1 in the order as shown in the table. And we know that for each of the references, there is a, an address. For example, the address of A of 0 is hex A000. The address of B of 0, we are assuming, is hex E000. The address of A of 1, as we just calculated, is hex A008, and so on. Now, putting this together with our understanding of how the cache views addresses, the cache views addresses as least significant 5 bits. Remember, these are 32-bit addresses. Least significant 5 bits are the byte offset within a block. And the next significant nine bits are the index into the cache directory. So in understanding what's going to happen within the cache when this program corresponding to these memory references executes, we have to view each of the addresses in the light of this uh, cache perspective on addresses. So consider A000 in hex. If I take A00 and I expand it into binary, this is what I end up with, a 32-bit sequence. Notice that A000, each of the hex digits is actually a 4-bit value. And I've given you only 4 hex digits, which means that this is really a 16-bit address. But I'm expanding it into a 32-bit address, since that is what the cache hardware is assuming. And I do, I do this by putting 16 most significant zeros. Right? I don't want to change the value of the address. Therefore, hex A000 is actually hex of um, 0, 0, 0, 0, A, 0, 0, 0, which is why I expand it in this way. If I now look at this 32-bit version of hex A, 0, 0, 0, which is the base address of the vector A, in terms of the least significant 5 bits, the next significant 9 bits, I find out that the index associated with A, 0, 0 is the value 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in binary, which you can compute to be equal to 256. Similarly, I can look at the address, the base address of B, B of 0, which is hex E000, which works out to the this bit sequence which I've expanded right now. So the E is 1110 in hex, and uh, the others are, are, other bits are all zeros. But if I look at the index bits corresponding to this address, I notice that once again, it's exactly the same as the index bits associated with A of 0 which means that in my direct map cache, the block containing vector element B of 0 would occupy the same cache block as the block containing vector element A of 0. This is a situation, the worst case situation that we talked about when we were worried about the problems with direct map caches, and it ha arises in this example. But if we continue to look through the sequence of references that we have, what is the, base what is the address of A of 1? The address of A of 1, as we saw, is 8 8 bytes or 8 more than the base address of A of 0. And that works out to the bit pattern, which is third in sequence here. It is 8 added to the base address of the array. And you notice it too has an index of 256 in, in decimal. And this we knew because we know that A of 1 is a neighbor of A of 0. And it would likely be in the same cache block as A of 0. And therefore, would have the same cache index. We, in fact, from our calculation from last time, Given that the size of each cache block is 32 bytes and the size of each array element is 8 bytes, we expect that four consecutive array elements, whether it be for A or B, four consecutive array elements would be in a single cache block. 
So we expected that A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 would all be within the same cache block. In other words, they would all have the same index. And as we proceed with expanding the addresses and looking at them in the light of the cache perspective on addresses, we do in fact see that is the case. A of 0, A of 1, A of 2 and A of 3 all have the same index and differ only in their offset bits within the block. They are talking about eight uh, different uh, collections of eight bytes within the block of size 32 bytes. But the current problem that we have is very clearly after A of 0 has been loaded, A of 0 if we were assuming that the cache starts off empty, then the attempt to load A of 0, the first reference made by this vector dot product program would have resulted in a cache miss and in handling the cache miss, the cache hardware would have copied the block from main memory into the cache. Unfortunately, the next reference made by this program is to B of 0 which is will load will also suffer a cache miss and will load the block containing B of 0 from memory into the cache. So that when the time comes to reference A of 1 next, the block which contains A of 1 is no longer present in the cache. It has been replaced by the block containing B of 0 through up to B of 3. So the bottom line is that when, when we do the analysis for this unfortunate program for the cache uh, uh, under consideration, we find out that every single reference is going to be a miss. And some of the misses are what we call conflict misses because they are a result, they are not a, a result of the program starting off with the cache empty. These conflict misses are a result of the program making references in such a fashion that the references of the program conflict with each other. The reference to B of 0 replaced the block which would have been used to satisfy the request for A of 1 and so on. So the program is conflicting. The references of the program conflict with each other resulting in misses. And this is not a problem with how the program started. It's a problem with the structure of the program, the way that the program was written. The bottom line then is this program will actually get no benefit from the cache. It will end up with a hit ratio of 0 percent. In other words, every single memory reference, every single reference made by this program will result in a memory access, 100 nanoseconds or more. And none of the references of this program will benefit from a one cycle, a one nanosecond cache hit. And the source of the pro problem as we saw was that the elements of the arrays A and B, which are accessed in the same order, A of 0 followed by B of 0, followed by A of 1, followed by B of 1, actually conflict with each other in the sense that they have the same cache index and in a direct mapped cache they need to occupy the same location in the cache and therefore one after the other they replace each other resulting in the 0 percent hit ratio. So the solution which we talked about last time was to actually try to amend this problem, correct this problem by causing the base address of let us say vector b to be adjusted so that there is no longer this problem of conflicting in terms of the index value with the base address of vector A. And uh, one way that I suggested this could be done is by assuming or using our knowledge of how compilers are likely to work in that compilers are, are the ones which assign the virtual addresses to the different variables, the different arrays of a program. And if we assume that the compilers do so by dealing with the declarations as they are encountered and using consecutive memory addresses for consecutive variables as they, are, as they are declared, then we could cause the base address of B to be changed, for example, by instead of using a declaration which says double A of 2048, B 2048, we artificially increase the size of the vector A as outlined over here to 2052. In other words, I increase the size of the vector A by four elements, which means I increase the size of the vector A by 32 bytes which is the size of one cache block which will mean that the address of vector b will go up by 32 and therefore its index will change by 1. That will be the net effect if you go back to the address uh, interpretation by the cache hardware. So the base address of b would now be E020 rather than E000 and its index, the, the, the index value, the cache index value for b of 0 would now be 257 rather than 256. And therefore, A of 0 and B of 0 would not conflict for the same cache block. And therefore, when A of 0 is loaded, there will be a cache miss for cold start reasons. After that, when B of 0 is loaded, there will be a cache miss for cold start reasons. And B of 0 will occupy a different location in the cache. Subsequently, the next reference to loading A of 1 will get a, will get a, a hit because it is in the same block as A of 0 was. We get the benefit of spatial locality of reference. And the bottom line is 
there is a hit ratio which is substantially more than the 0 percent that we got. I had also suggested an alternative way to set this up. Rather than artificially increasing the size of the array A, if I am assuming that the compiler assigns addresses in order of enco encountering the declaration, then as long as I, even if I kept the address of A, the, the size of the, declare, the declared size of vector A as 2048, if I was to include other variables between the declaration of A and the declaration of B, then I could achieve the same effect of causing the base address of B to be adequately different from the base address of A. For example, in this, in this uh, variant, I have A declared as a vector of size 2048 as, as it should be, B is also declared as a vector of size 2048, but in between I declare four variables dummy 1, dummy 2, dummy 3, dummy 4, each is of type double which means that the total space occupied by these four variables would be 32 bytes. The base address of D1 would be hex E000, the base address if the compiler assigns consecutive contiguous addresses, the base address of D2 would be E008 and so on, so that the base address of B would end up being E020, which has a sufficiently different index value to not conflict with the base th with the vector A. Now, the four variables D1 through D4 are not variables that my program will use and therefore even though they may conflict with the vector A if they had been used, the problem does not arise for my, for my, for this particular program. They are variables which are declared and included in the program merely for the purpose of causing the base address of A of vector B to be such that it does not conflict with the vector A. So the bottom line in this case would be a substantially improved hit ratio and you can do the calculation to find out that it would be at least 75 percent, a great improvement over our 0 percent. Okay, now there are other ways that one could handle this particular problem with this loop and another idea is the idea which is sometimes known as array merging. Let me just let you know what array merging amounts to. Now you will recall that in the previous uh, version of the program, I declared A as a vector of size 2048 and I declared B as a vector of size 2048. But I noted that the way that my program was using the elements of A and the elements of B was that after referring to element A of I, it next referred to element B of I. In other words, there is this relationship between A of I and B of I, which I could actually cause to be reflected in the declaration of A and B for example by something like what we have on the screen here. So rather than declaring A and B as separate vectors, here what I have done is I have declared A and B as being elements of a struct, a structure and I declare an array of those structure elements. The size of that array is 2048. Within each element of the struct there is one element of A and one element of B. For example, within the element 0 of the array. I actually have what I used to refer to as A of 0 and B of 0 and they are packaged together in element 0 of the array by this struct which I have declared. So now when I need to write my the vector operation, what I, what I have to observe is that I need to multiply the A element of <coughs> ar array in each iteration through this loop, I multiply the A element of the ith, per, uh, the, the, the a part of the ith element of the array by the b part of the ith element of the array and then I accumulate them into the sum variable. So it is a minor variant in that the calculation which is computed is the same as what it was before, but we have changed things in that if you think about the addresses of a and b under this kind of a declaration, every element of the array will have an element of A and an element of B and therefore the element of A and the corresponding element of B will be in con consecutive memory locations. And therefore you doing the kind of calculations that we had talked about up to now, we would have found out that the element of A 0 and the element of B 0 would be next to each other in memory and therefore they would be in the same cache block. And therefore while access to array I of A might be a cache miss, access to array I of B would be a cache hit. And similarly when I go to the next iteration, first el the elements of A and B would be hits and this is why we come up with an estimate that there would be a 75 percent hit ratio. So this is an alternative perspective on how one could improve from that 0 percent hit ratio for the self same operation of computing the dot product of two vectors. Now in some situations it may not be a good idea to change a declaration like this because you will as you are aware when you write programs often 
you would want the program to be readable and that the meaning of the program should reflect some the natural phenomenon or the physics problem or the, the actual objective for which the program was being written. And by artificially packaging elements of A along with elements of B, it may become a little bit harder for the person un re reading or using the program to understand it. But one should bear in mind that the benefits of doing this may make it worthwhile to reassess the readability of the program. And just remember, this is an alternative to the previous technique which, are, which I had suggested, where one carefully had caused the base address of the conflicting vector B to be adjusted, either by adding additional dummy variables in between or by artificially declaring one of the vectors a little bit bigger than it actually needed to be. Okay, now, <coughs> moving right along, let's look at a, a new example. Now, the, the next example I'm going to look at is something which I will refer to as DAXPY, and I will pronounce this as DAXP. Until now, the examples that we used had uh, expanded names, which were we could understand the name from the uh, rough understanding of what like vector dot product was. Here, for the first time, very clearly, this is not going to be the case. But obviously, this is an important operation, so important that it has this abbreviated name form. <coughs> okay, now the but what the DAXP operation, the DAXP program that we're going to talk about does is a double precision operation where it multiplies a vector x by a scalar value a, that is the a x, and then adds to it each element, the corresponding element of a vector b. So double precision a multiplied by x plus y is what uh, DAXP refers to. And one could think of uh, another program which I might call SACSP and as you would imagine this must be referring to a similar operation but rather than operating on double precision values it operates on single precision or 32 bit floating point values. So clearly these must be very important operations and we will refer to DAXP later. But the nature of the operation is quite clear. Once again we have two vectors, a vector x and a vector y. Each time through a loop as we are going to see an element of x is multiplied by some scalar, uh, a variable value a, a, right? So a is not a vector, a is a single valued uh, variable. And then the corresponding element of the vector y is added to that product, producing the new value of that element of the vector y. So if I had to view DAXP as a, a piece of C code, as we were doing with the vector sum, the vector dot product and so on, this is what I would see. <coughs> Once again, I have the vector x which is declared as double and of some size, once again I am using a size 2048. The vector y also declared as a of the same size and I have the scalar a, a is not a vector, a is a single valued uh, variable. Each time through the for loop, uh, one an element, the ith element of x is multiplied by a and added to the ith element of y and this becomes the new value of the ith element of y and this is how the vector y is the value of the vector y is computed. So this operation I will refer to as DAXP. So once again as always we need to start by understanding exactly what the reference sequence is. We are going to ignore the variable a since the variable a could very easily be stored in a register. There is no need each time through this loop to load the value of a from a memory location into a register. The value of a does not change for the duration of this loop. Similarly I will assume that the loop index is maintained in register and that I need concentrate only on the references to x of i, y of i and the additional reference this time to y of i. Note that there is a, a need to load x of i the multiplied by a then there is a need to load y of i, add it to this product and then subsequently to store the result into y of i. Therefore there are three operations, three memory operations in each iteration of the DAXP loop. So if I think about the reference sequence, I look back at the first iteration through the loop. In the first iteration through the loop, i is equal to 0. Therefore, I need to load x of 0, then do the multiplication. Then I need to load y of 0, and then do the addition. And then I need to store the result into y of 0. Therefore, these are the three operations in the first iteration of the for loop. Load x of 0, load y of 0, and store y of 0. Similarly, in the second iteration, when i is equal to 1, I will load x of 1, load y of 1, and store y of 1, and so on for all of the 2048 iterations. Okay, now once again, we need to make some assumption about the base address of the, of the vector x and the vector y, as we now call them. 
but uh, we could actually uh, quite easily short circuit uh, the operation of going through the full calculation on the basis of drawing a table. What if we at this point we said let us assume that we know enough about how to adjust the base address of x and the base address of y so that they do not conflict. If, uh, I, if I in, in finding the base address of x and the base address of y I found out that they end up having the same index then I could always adjust the base address of y. So, let me assume that I have done that adjusting and now I can actually look at this, this, this sequence of instructions and try to understand what will happen in terms of hits and misses. So, I might say and again we are going to avoid drawing the whole table since at this point it may be possible to do the analysis quite quickly. The first reference is to load x of 0 and I might say this is guaranteed to be a cold start miss. So, no hope for that. Then there is load y of 0. I am assuming it does not conflict with x of 0, but this too is guaranteed to be a cold start miss. Then I store y of 0. Now, I know for I can be quite sure that since the previous reference loaded y of 0, y of 0 will be in the cache when the store instruction is executed and therefore, I can be quite confident that the store y of 0 will be a cache hit. Right? So, this is a, a new thing which we did not have in our previous examples. A guarantee that there will be a cache hit because the same variable, the same element was accessed in this case in the pre by the previous instruction. I move on to the next iteration and I can again see that x of 0, x of 1, x of 2 and x of 3 are all going to be in the same cache block and therefore, I would be quite confident that load x of 1 is going to be a cache hit. Similarly, load y of 1 is going to be a cache hit and as always store y of 1 is going to be a cache hit and I can therefore proceed with the analysis, but uh, instead of drawing the table as I said let us try to do the analysis in terms of calculating how many hits I am going to get for the loads of x of i, how many hits I am going to get for the loads of y of i and how many hits I am going to get for the stores of y of i. I know that each I, I know that I am going to have to load x of i 2048 times. I know that the first one would be a miss, but the next three would be hits. Subsequently, the attempt to load x of 4 would be a miss. So, I know that one out of every four references to x of i is going to be a miss, but the remaining three out of four because of spatial locality of reference will be hits. Therefore, as far as the 2048 loads of the vector elements of x of i are concerned, I can say that there would be 1536 hits. What I am going to do is calculate the hit ratio in the upper right, right hand corner. I can then move to my assessment of what about the loading of the 2048 elements of y of i and once again I know in the first iteration there will be a cold start miss, in the second iteration because of spatial locality there will be a hit, similarly in the third and fourth iterations there will be hits and just as in the case of the loads of x of i for the loads of y of i there will be 1536 hits out of 2048 references. So, the number of hits that I expect are 1536 for the references to a, another 1536 for the references to y. What about the last uh, sequence of references that I am making the stores to the elements of y? I know that all of those 2048 stores are going to be hits. So, I just added 2048 for the guaranteed hits as far as the store instructions are concerned. How do I calculate the hit ratio? I divide the total number of hits by the total number of memory references. What is the total number of memory references? That is going to be given by the number of iterations which is 2048 multiplied by the number of memory references per iteration which is 3. Therefore, the denominator of my hit ratio calculation will be 2048 multiplied by 3 which is 6144. So, I actually know that the hit ratio will be this value and if you do the calculation you will find out that under the assumption that the base addresses of x and y do not conflict in the cache, we come up with this quick assessment that the hit ratio will be 83.3 percent and this was higher than the 75 percent that we got in the previous example because of the slight difference in the nature of the program where we had one third of all references being guaranteed hits by the very nature of the I am sorry the, I, should, I, I should be circling the stores. So, the stores are all going to be hits because of the fact that the element which is being stored was just accessed by the previous instruction which was a load instruction. <coughs> so, DAXP was quite easy for us to analyze and there was no need for us to draw the table. We would like to move in this direction. What you, what you are observing is that we are moving away from a requirement of actually knowing the base addresses 
or actually doing the calculation of the index value for each of the uh, elements with this experience of having worked through two or three simple examples. And with this kind of uh, quick analysis, we get a very good idea of what to expect when the program will actually execute on a given piece of cache hardware. So we can actually move on to another example quite, quite rapidly. I did want to just remind you that we will be encountering DAXP again. That's why I wanted to introduce the, 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 the word DAX, the, the term DAXP. We will be encountering it again in, in, in the not too distant future. Okay, now let's move on to a slightly more uh, interesting example. <coughs> this example is uh, an example in which we're not dealing with ordinary one-dimensional vectors anymore, but we're actually dealing with a two-dimensional matrix. And the operation is quite simple. We have two two-dimensional matrices and we want to add them element by element. So, so the, the structure of the program is as shown over here. I have two double position two-dimensional matrices. So each matrix has 1024 rows, each of which is made up of 1024 columns. The picture that you can have in mind when thinking of either the matrix A or the matrix B is rather than when, when we thought of a vector, we thought of a linear uh, entity. When we think of a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix, we think of an element which has many rows. So the lines which I have drawn are meant to represent the different rows. So there are 2048 rows, which would be numbered from row 0 up to row 2047. And each row is com comprised of 2048 columns. And the columns are numbered from 0 up to 2047. So this is the picture that one could have in mind when thinking of, let's say, the matrix A or the matrix B. And any particular element of the matrix is referred to using two indices, the row index and the column index. For example, to refer to that element over there, if this is the matrix A, then I refer to it as A of 0, which means in row 0, 0. In other words, specifically in column 0. So the element of row 0, column 0 of the matrix A. And that's the notation which we use in C, exactly the same. So I have two such matrices and I want to add them element by element. And in this particular example, I am putting the result of doing this addition as a new value of the matrix B. So in this particular case, we need to have a doubly nested for loop. And uh, each, time through the, each time through the doubly nested for loop, an element of A, the, ith, the element of A in the ith row and the jth column is added to the corresponding element of B. In other words, the element of B from the ith row and jth column. The addition is done and this becomes a new value of that particular element of B. In other words, the ith row and jth column of B takes on this sum. So you notice that the number of times that this uh, statement within the loop is, go is going to be executed is 1024 multiplied by 1024. Since the number of elements in this two di each of these two dimensional matrices is 1024 multiplied by 1024. Okay, so as, as before, we can run through this example by trying to lay out the, re the order in which the different references occur. So I try to derive the reference sequence. So in looking at this, uh, just bear in mind that we have a situation where there are doubly nested for loops. In other words, f if you consider the for loop on the outside, I'll refer to the J loop as the for loop on the outside. So initially the for loop, the J loop will cause J to have a value of zero. Then we enter the inner loop, which is the I loop in this case. So the terminology which I've used is I talk about the J loop as the outer loop and the i loop as the inner loop. Within the inner loop, we start by setting i equal to 0. And therefore, the first memory operation that happens is loading a of 0, 0. After that, we load b of 0, 0. And then we, store, we do the addition, and we store the result in b of 0, 0. Then we step back and increment i by 1. So we go from i equal to 0 to i equal to 1. j is still 0. And therefore, the next vector element or the next matrix element that we deal with is adding A of 1, 0 to B of 1, 0. So we have an operation of loading A of 1, 0, loading B of 1, 0, doing the addition, and storing the, pro the sum into B of 1, 0. So if I was to, and so on. So as I write out the complete reference sequence, I have the first iteration through this doubly nested loop, which loaded A of 0. 0, 0, loaded B of 0, 0, did the addition, and stored the result in B of 0, 0. 
After that remember that the value of i changed to 1 because we were the inner loop will be iterated 2000 and, uh, 1024 times I am sorry this is 1024 and not 2047. So, these numbers should not have been 2047, but 1023. So, in the second iteration through the doubly nested loop, I load a of 1 0. Remember that i has been incremented to 1. So, it will be a of 1 0 and then I load b of 1 0, do the addition and put the result in b of 1 0 and so on. So, there will be 1024 multiplied by 1024 iterations through this and there will be the corresponding number of references in the reference sequence. Okay, now, to actually proceed from here, things are a little bit more complicated than what we talked about in the case of the vector examples that we looked at. Because when we talked about the vector examples, it was very clear that uh, the assumption we were making was that the neighbors of A of, for example, a neighbor of A of 0 would be A of 1 and the neighbors of A of 1 would be A of 0 and A of 2. We assumed that the vector elements were laid out con consecutively in memory. But when we have a two dimensional structure such as what is shown over here, we do have to ask the question on the screen. In what order are the elements of a multi dimensional array such as this two dimensional array which we are currently looking at stored in memory? And you will quickly realize that there are at least, I am sorry, there are two possibilities. Unlike the case of the vector where it was clear that there was only the one option consecutive vector elements in consecutive memory locations, here there are two possibilities. You could either have the, the neighbor of A of 0, 0 being A of 0, 1 and the neighbor of A of 0, 1 could be A of 0, 2. Alternatively, it could the, the, it, the compiler could lay, lay out the array elements in, in memory, matrix elements in memory, so that the neighbor of A of 0, 0 is A of 1, 0 and the neighbor of A of 1, 0 is A of 2, 0 and so on. So, there are at least these two possibilities, which is why we will spend the whole slide just giving some terminology to these two possibilities. So, this is a, a, a topic which is sometimes known as the storage order of multi dimensional arrays. In our particular example, we are looking at two dimensional arrays, but something similar would happen for three, four, or higher dimensional arrays. The two options which I just talked about <coughs> are, in fact, known as the row major order and the column major order. And the row major order was the first which we had looked at the idea that the elements of the first row of the matrix are stored in consecutive memory locations and they are then followed by the elements of the second row of the matrix etc. as I had suggested to start off with. Remember the first row of the matrix A is the elements circled and therefore the neighbor of A of 0 0 is A of 0 1 and the neighbor of A of 0 1 is A of 0 2 and so on which means that in consecutive locations in memory one would find the different elements of the first row of the matrix and this would be followed by the elements of the second row of the matrix and so on. So, in some sense one could talk about the storage order as being row by row. If one looked at how they are laid out in memory, first the first row, then the second row, then the third row. Remember that the memory that we have, the main memory has a linear ordering of the bytes from 0 up to 2 power seven, given the number of bytes in memory. So, that is why the idea of row major order is to view the ordering of the matrix elements when stored in memory as being row by row, hence the name row major. And this is in fact the convention used by C, the, the C language, the con con convention used by C compilers. The alternative what is known as column major order, the one which I had spoken of second, will actually store the, the two dimensional array column by column in memory. In other words, first the first column, column 0 of the matrix A followed in memory by the second column of matrix A and so on. And this order too is not uh, ignored, this order is used by some programming languages such as Fortran. So, this is an interesting thing to note, Th which of these two storage orders is used for your multi dimensional arrays of your program will depend on what language you have used to write the program. Now, coming back to our example of the matrix, two dimensional matrix sum, we have understood the reference order, the reference order was load A of 0, 0, load B of 0, 0 and then store B of 0, 0 followed by load A of 1, 0, load B of 1, 0, store B of 1, 0 and so on. In other words, the order in which the elements of A, here I have a diagram showing you the matrix A, we first access A of 0, 0 and next we access A of 1, 0. If you, if, if you are looking at the order in which the elements of matrix A 
are being accessed by my program. So the elements of matrix A are being or referenced by my program column by column. That is the observation which I would make. And similarly, I can observe that the elements of ma matrix B, first I access B of 0, 0, then B of 0, 0 once again. But the next uh, element of matrix B which I access is B of 1, 0, which means that in the case of B2, in the case of B also, we are accessing the elements of B column by column, which we des which I will designate by this. First, the first column, after that the second column and so on. Now, you would have noticed that the program that we, were st we started with seems to have been programmed in C. And we just learned in the previous slide that as far as C is concerned, the row major ordering of array elements is used. In other words, if you looked at consecutive memory locations, you would find first the first row of matrix A and then after that the se second row of matrix A and so on. What does that mean? It means that we are, the program is accessing the array elements column by column, but the array, array elements are stored in memory row by row. And what does that mean in terms of the cache performance? What this tells us is that first of all, A of 0, 0 was referenced and that is going to be a cold start miss. At some, in some, some, sometime soon after that, A of 1, 0 is referenced, but we know that the block, the cache block containing A of 0, 0, given that this is a program written in C, will contain the neighbors of A in the row containing A. And therefore, the cache block will contain A of 0, 0, A of 0, 1, A of 0, 2, and A of 0, 3. Whereas the second reference that I have made in this program is to load A of 1, 0. And therefore, this will not be a cache hit due to spatial locality of reference, but rather it will be another cache miss. So therefore, this is a, a negative. We, we, no, we notice that this, the program in the way that we have written it is not going to benefit from spatial locality of reference. It is basically going to have A of 0, 0, a cold start miss. A, a of 1, 0, a cold start miss. Similarly for B. B of 0, 0 is going to be a cold start miss. Store B of 0, 0 will be a hit because B of 0, 0 was referenced by the previous instruction. But other than the store instructions, all the remaining instructions will not benefit from spatial locality of reference. And this is a negative. This means that our program is not, was not written with knowledge of cache in mind. Right? So bottom line is our, pro, our, our loop will show no spatial locality of reference. Our, our loop is showing temporal locality of reference. Notice that all the references to the store instructions benefit from locality, but they benefit from benefiting from temporal locality, not from spatial locality. And practically our, our program will not really, as far as we can see, show any spatial locality of reference. Even if we assume that A and B are not conflicting with each other. So in, in trying to come up with the heat ratio cal calculation, we can make the assumption that we can use packing or some other technique to make sure that the accesses to A and B do not conflict with each other due to base address type of a problem. <coughs> but the situation is going to be that in the iterations we will have a miss for A of 0, 0, a miss for B of 0, 0, and then the hit for the store. But that's going to happen for each array element. And therefore, we suspect that we may we end up with a hit ratio of about one third or 33 percent, which is much lower than the kinds of hit ratio we were getting with the previous examples that we looked at. Remember, 75 percent, 83 percent, and so on. So this is not uh, that uh, this does not seem to be a, a well-written program from the perspective of comparison with other programs that we were able to analyze. There is, of course, one issue which I would want to raise. The suggestion is that we have this hit ratio of 33 percent or 33.3 percent to be, to be more accurate. But there is an underlying question which maybe would be worth thinking about. We, we noticed that when A of 0, 0 was missed, the block containing A of 0, 0 would be loaded into the cache. And uh, the block containing A of 0, 0 would have contained A of 0, 0 along with A of 0, 1, A of 0, 2, and A of 0, 3, which are the three neighbors in the row as far as the two-dimensional matrix A is concerned. So the block will contain those four array elements. Unfortunately, the next few iterations of my loop do not refer to A of 0, 1, A of 0, 2, or A of 0, 3, which is why we said that the program does not show good spatial, uh, spatial locality of reference. But we do know that sometime later, this program is going to access A of 0, 1, A of 0, 2, and A of 0, 3. Hence this question. Much later in, in time, when this program executes the loop where it loads A of 0, 1, will A of 0, 1 still be in the cache? 
can we calculate whether a of 0 1 will still be in the cache if that is the case then a of 0 1 the load of a of 0 1 will actually be a hit the load of b of 0 1 by the same token would be a hit and so on and therefore the hit ratio may be substantially better than 33.3 percent and we might actually benefit from spatial locality of reference so the question is how do we analyze whether later on in time when when our program does in fact try to load a of 0 1 the block containing a of 0 1 which was fetched by the first load instruction in the program will still be in the cache and one way to reason about this rather quickly is just to bear in mind that <coughs> in our particular uh, program we have a situation where there are row uh, if you look at the si the size of each column we have a situation where the size of each column is 1024 elements and therefore you should note that the, when we will come to loading a of 0 1 after we have finished going through the inner loop once and therefore the question has to be analyzed in terms of how much of the cache would have been filled by the time we come back to the outer loop and change the value of j to 1 and with this calculation we will be able to get an answer to the question about whether a of 0 1 would be present in the cache or not and based on that calculation we will be able to figure out whether the hit ratio might in fact be higher than what we have calculated over here I leave that for you to analyze on the side okay so with this we have an understanding that for multi-dimensional arrays there may be something a little bit more complicated and that we may have to go back to the source code or our C program in order to improve it in order to make the hit ratio higher okay now the simple idea which we're going to try to to do for the, to, to, to analyze this is something which is called loop interchange and the idea of loop interchange is you remember that we started off with our vector uh, our uh, two-dimensional two matrix sum the, the program looked like this and you remember that the outer loop was the J loop and the inner loop this is what we had earlier was the I loop and each time through the loop we were accessing A of I J and B of I J okay now what if we realized that the problem with this loop was that we were going through the uh, th through the two-dimensional matrices column by column and that we could correct for that by just going through the two-dimensional matrices row by row there's nothing in the definition of matrix sum two-dimensional matrix sum which says that we have to go through the matrices column by column we could just as well have gone through them row by row and one way to achieve that is actually to interchange the J loop with the I loop in other words instead of having the J loop as the outer loop and the I loop as the inner loop I could modify the program so that the I loop is the outer loop and the J loop is the inner loop which is what I've done now notice that uh, the outer loop is now a loop in which the I vary the value of I I being the first index into the matrix A and the matrix B and the inner loop is now the J loop which means that initially the first time you go through the outer loop I will be equal to 0 then you go to the inner loop and J will be equal to 0 and therefore you operate on A of 0 0 and B of 0 0 after that you go to the second iteration of the inner loop where the value of J is changed to 1 and you operate on A of 0 1 B of 0 1 and notice that this is now stepping through the two matrices row by row therefore bearing in mind that this was a C program and that in a C program the two-dimensional two, two matrices would be stored row by row by just correctly interchanging the two, the, the two loops the inner loop the J loop and the I loop along the lines of what we see here we would be causing the program to, ca to have a reference sequence which is the same as the storage order for the array elements so, so we now have a situation where the modified program and all that I've done is to interchange the, the line for I line by the 4J line that's the only change that was made the reference sequence will now be load A of 0 0 load B of 0 0 store B of 0 0 followed by load A of 0 1 load B of 0 1 store B of 0 1 and now we notice that the program will benefit from spatial locality of reference the load B A of 0 0 will be a cold start miss load B of 0 0 will be a cold start miss store B of 0 0 will be a hit load A of 0 1 will be a hit because of spatial locality of reference similarly load B of 0 1 and similarly load A of 0 2 load A of 0 3 will be hits and therefore we get a substantially improved hit ratio in fact the 83.3 percent which we had the best kind of hit ratio that we had seen from our previous examples 
So clearly in trying to deal with programs that have multidimensional arrays or the two dimensional arrays that we are looking at right now, it is important to have the order in which the array elements are accessed carefully thought out. Otherwise you will have a situation where the reference sequence differs from the storage order of the array elements and therefore spatial locality will not become available and the, the program will not benefit from the spatial locality properties benefits of the underlying cache hardware. Okay, now this uh, idea of loop interchange is interesting, the idea that one could uh, interchange the I loop and the J loop, but this is similar to something that we have seen earlier. You recall that when we were talking about instruction scheduling, I interchanged the instructions at the machine language level. And at that point I had a point made, made special mention that it may not always be safe to just arbitrarily interchange two instructions since the meaning of the program could change. The net effect of executing the modified program could be different from the net effect of executing the pre-existing program. And therefore we do have to ask the question of whether one can just interchange the I loop and the J loop without changing the meaning of the program. <coughs> now for this particular example, the two dimensional matrix sum, you would quite easily be able to satisfy yourself that there is no harm from interchanging the I loop and the, for and the J loop. In that each time through this loop, we are just dealing with array element A of IJ of B and the corresponding element of A, adding them together and modifying the, array, the, the matrix B. And that therefore whether I go through the matrices row by row or column by column, the net effect is going to be the same on the result. In other words, the final value of the matrix B. And that the only difference is that the version in which I have interchanged the loops will run faster because of the cache, improved cache behavior. But there could well be loops in which it is not safe to do this kind of an interchange and maybe we have to understand loop interchange a little bit more carefully in order to, uh, to figure out whether loop interchange is a generally applicable phenomenon or whether we have to do it m much more carefully with a little bit more uh, caution. And I, I would ask you to just check, f satisfy yourself that for this particular loop it is perfectly safe to do the loop interchange, there is absolutely no danger of the program doing something different. Right? Now in the next lecture we will actually start by moving to an example where it is not safe to interchange the loops and we will try to analyze why it is not safe before proceeding to some other examples in this sequence. In this class you will recall that we have looked at some useful additions to our repertoire of techniques to improve cache performance. We had seen the idea of packing or changing the base address of a matrix of a vector in the previous lecture. We added to that the idea of actually merging to two, to two vectors into a single vector to get the benefit of spatial locality across the two array references. Then we began looking at multidimensional matrices and realized that it may be important to make sure that the storage order in terms of how the compiler is assigning addresses to the elements of the multidimensional array should be well aligned with the order in which the program references the array elements. Otherwise, once again, the program may not benefit from spatial locality of reference. And we will stop here for today. Thank you.